Hi everyone, welcome to my guide for the Crushing Hand Spiritborn. Lately I had a chance to play the expansion ahead of time for the press for early access and I was blasting Spiritborn for like a hundred hours or so, cooking builds and trying stuff out. And one of them is the Crushing Hand Spiritborn. It is a really fun to play build, it's probably the best speed farming build on the entire class or even almost in the entire game. It has incredible AoE, it jumps from enemy to enemy at all times, it is very tanky. And it just kind of like destroys everything, even all the way up into Atomic 4 and beyond. What you see here is a very unoptimized setup that I had with just, you know, like some stuff I put together with like almost no master working, almost no ancestrals, and I was still able to comfortably do Atomic 4 content with this. So it is quite powerful. It doesn't push the pit as high as, for example, Quill Volley or Touch of Death. If you have been looking at those builds, uh, those are probably going to go the highest tiers. But, uh, I mean, Crushing Hand will get really close to that. It just doesn't mean really have exactly this boss damage at the very late stages in, like, you know, pit 100 plus or so. Outside of that, though, you're going to literally crush everything of this, and uh, it just feels extremely fun to play. So I have been cooking a planner for this and actually made a max roll guide, both for leveling and for the end game here, that uh, I will show off to you uh, briefly, and you can also go and find them in the description and read up on all of the details. I'll highlight the most important things for this build now in this video, and I will show you the planner and what it's all about. Similar to some other Spiritborn builds, this one relies on the Rod of Kepileke plus Midnight Sun combo. Rod of Kepileke is a huge power boost for any kind of core skill because, first of all, it makes him free to cast, so you don't worry about the resources once you acquire it. Before that, we have to do, you know, a few tricks with our skills in order to actually have permanent resource recovery all the time, which is achievable even relatively early in the, in the leveling process. But then once you get that unique weapon, you will have no worries about resources at all because you just spam your crushing hand. But more importantly, you also want to fill your resource bar uh, as fast as possible at all times in order to benefit from the extra crit damage and guaranteed crit effect that the Rod of Capilega brings. And this is done by combining it with the Ring of the Midnight Sun. This thing restores some of the resources that you have spent in the last two seconds. And with a perfect roll, you can get up to 50% restoration. This means you need to stack 100% resource generation bonus in order to make that number fill your entire resource bar on every attack. And you can see this here right now. Every time I attack, my resource goes to zero, and then it instantly goes up to 100%. And this makes it so that your Rod of Kapileke always procs, gives you a guaranteed crit. That crit is way more powerful. And on top of this, your crushing hand is massive. Like the Rod of Kapileke also makes it larger. As you can see here, I'm hitting like half the screen all the time. And this is thanks to the Rod of Kapileke. We don't even need extra crushing hand size tempers, for example. So we just need that combo. Get the, uh, you know, perfect uh, amount of restoration for your uh, resources. And then you just have the full AOE all the time with insane amounts of damage. So this part is very important to understand. If you don't fill your resources between every attack, you will not trigger the Roll of Capileke effect. Your size uh, will be smaller on the Crushing Hands AoE, and you will also do just no guaranteed crit, and you don't have the extra bonus. So you want to try to hit that 100% resource restoration. So this depends a bit on the Ring of the Midnight Sun roll that you got. If you have like a crappy roll, then you need to invest more into resource generation, but you can do that, for example, from Tempers on your Ring and uh, Neck, and you can also have some on the Paragons. There are some Paragon nodes on the uh, sapping paragon uh, board for example that give you extra resource generation you get some from your main stat and then there's also measured ravager which gives you 30 percent and if you have permanent uptime on that which is relatively easy to do at the very least in farming content then you will have an easy time getting to that 100 percent extra resource generation or maybe more depending on the ring roll that you got another cool mechanic in this build is prodigy's tempo prodigy's tempo allows you to first of all get extra skill ranks when you combine the crushing hand with Rod of Capileke, making it a basic skill. But more importantly, it allows you to reset your cooldowns all the time when you cast your core skill three times in a row. And with crushing hand, we are incentivized to do that anyway because of the unrelenting aspect. This is the core skill aspect for the skill that after casting the skill three times in a row without interruption, then you will get those 10 extra explosions. So we have even more AOE damage output. This means that you go from two hits, two hits, two hits to... 2, 2, and 12. So you get a lot of extra hits, and those all can proc lucky hits. You actually have a lot of crowd control lucky hit procs in this build, for example. You can stagger bosses very fast, everything is CC'd, and uh, you can just trigger whatever you want, basically. 
And in this case, this has a perfect synergy because in both cases, you want to attack three times exactly in order to trigger either Apology's Tempo or Unrelenting. And so you try to focus on just spam your Crushing Hand, for example, on the boss fight as much as possible, then face roll off your cooldowns once, and then spam Crushing Hand again to get those procs all the time. So this is the main part about how the build works. And we have the planner here. We also have the guides. So if you go to Max Roll, for example, we have a lot of these Spirit Bone guides already published. Here's the Crushing Hand endgame and here's also the crushing hand leveling so we have both available so this is where you get started and here is like where you progress later on and in the planner we have this here so there's also these different uh, variants that you can find so there's like the leveling and so on you can like, click through them to see the progression of the uh, you know skill trees of the items and so on you can also see for example here the different steps of the skill trees same here if you want to like, do the 1260 leveling in more detail and also the paragons, they have these multiple steps. So just according to your progression, you can kind of check out, okay, uh, where are you? What is that you're aiming for now? Where do you put the next points? And so on. And I'm going to be talking mostly about the Mythic variant here, which uh, funny enough actually doesn't run the Mythic. This class is so good, you don't need Mythics, <laughs> or you don't want Mythics in many builds actually. Uh, but there are cases where sometimes we can throw them in. But in this build, I felt like it was not really an upgrade to have any Mythic. Uh, main reason for that is actually because you want to stack a lot of resolve stacks. So you see this here. We have a maximum resolve stack and a triple masterwork, for example. This is a very powerful buff in this build because you get various synergies here. So number one, more resolve stacks allows you to get hit more often. So you keep the 20% damage reduction at all times. But uh, more importantly, the more resolve stacks you have, you get more damage with your crushing hand from the rampant crushing hand upgrade. You see here with the amount of resolve stacks, I think this build reaches close to 40 stacks or so with perfect gear. You get more than double damage on a crushing hand from that. And there's even more from the colossal glyph, which has effectively the same uh, bonus here. You get 2% per stack of resolve. Very powerful damage bonuses. And lastly, we also have perseverance. that gives you damage reduction per stack of resolve. So this passive alone, when you have like 40 stacks, is something like more than 40% damage reduction, I believe. They stack um, multiplicatively per uh, stack, so it doesn't just go to like 100% damage reduction, for example. But it is still very helpful for extra defense. So this build pops off quite hard in the late game, I would say, because once you get those resolved tempers, and then you also master work them up, they actually, you know, ramp pretty hard more than on most other builds, I would say. In fact, these maximum resolve stacks are so good that, for example, here on the pants, I didn't even master work up the basic skill ranks. Instead, I master worked up the resolve stacks because we already have a lot of extra ranks here. We have 13. I think the basic skills is not included, so it's like 16 ranks. You could get a few more, and hitting the basic skill ranks is not bad, let's say. This is also an option, but uh, you actually want to hit the maximum resolve stacks because you get more scaling from all of these other effects. Some other important synergies here are the Harmony of Ibawaka. This allows you to combine three different uh, bird attacks for an extra damage boost. You get 30% per attack and you get an extra attack from your secondary spirit hall. So we have a gorilla skill. This is tagged gorilla. And then we have centipede in a primary hall. This uh, by default makes everything also centipede. And then with harmony, we get the jaguar attack as well. And jaguar has a bunch of really good passives down here. There's potent and furnace, for example, and a few things on paragons, for example. So this is really nice to have. And we use centipede here, which is... Uh, very nice damage reduction effect, basically. So it slows everything and then gives you damage reduction, and it allows us to pick up some of these extra passives here. It's kind of hard to find all the passive uh, points to really, um, you know, like max out these passives, but in just like the extra 30% crowd control duration will actually lead to this build having incredible amounts of stagger. So you walk up to the boss, you stagger them, and you get a bunch of extra damage modifiers. The boss doesn't do anything. You're going to be very safe with this stuff. And lastly, we have the Rakanos Wake. This is mostly here for the extra resistances. A lot of Spirit Bond builds like this because it just frees up all of your resistance rolls and you can go like triple skull here in most cases and you're going to be fine with your resistances for example and you can like roll armor instead of resistances on your gear so that's the main reason to run Rakanos Wake it also has kind of okay stats so you just kind of throw that in here but this is an optional item I'd say it just allows us to stack so much more armor and you can see here that for example in this planner we have like four and a half k armor and this doesn't include like for example the uh, mercenary right now so it's gonna be like a 5k ish armor and this gives us a huge damage buff from the uh, unyielding hits aspect here, it's this one. So this converts your armor into weapon damage, meaning this is the same as having a stronger weapon. And in our case, when you get like 30% of uh, 5k armor, that's going to be like 1500 extra weapon damage on top of the around 500 that your weapon has. So it's like a quadruple damage. 
just from armor and this aspect. And then a few other important damage aspects here is redirected force. We scale block chance. We, first of all, we have a lot of block chance by default just from the uh, weapon that we use. And then there's also patient guard here. You could also get block chance from other sources but you already have passively a lot. And then there is uh, Armored Height that gives you 100% block chance. So whenever that is active, you actually have an even stronger damage buff from Redirected Force. And then we have uh, Apprehension Aspect here. This is 40% damage to feared enemies. We fear with Scourge. So you kind of like walk around, press Scourge, stop his fear, you get a big burst. The good thing is that because of Prodigy's Tempo, as you spam your core skills, you get all of these resets on everything. And it will take not more than like five seconds or so in most cases to actually reset all of your cooldowns when you just keep spamming your crushing hand on a target. This includes even your ultimate, which usually has a relatively long cooldown. It will come back really quickly with Prodigy's Tempo, thanks to uh, you know this insane attack speed that you'll have in a late game. So we try to stack a lot of attack speed here where we can. For example, we have it on the ring and uh, here on the glove and so on. And this helps you to proc this even more often. And you will have uh, basically a permanent Ravager, a permanent Scourge, a near permanent counter attack for 100% dodge chance. We have a Hunter all the time. We have Armored Hide basically up all the time. And uh, yeah, it's just going to be very well protected, very safe and highly mobile. Now in the early game, this will look a little bit different here. So for example, if you go with the leveling section here, this is where you start out. Uh, you see the skill bar changes a little bit. We now have like a generator on the bar. We have a bunch of eagle stuff here as well. Uh, the main reason to do this in the early game in order to not run out of resources is to be run uh, vital strikes. So before we can do this whole combo with Prodigy's Tempo and just like spam our crushing hand all day long, we do this. This gives us healing, gives us vigor and a bit of a damage buff, and we just try to stack a lot of vulnerable effects here. So we have the Seeker, for example, this is one of the ultimates. You can pop this, and then it knocks everything down, it applies vulnerable multiple times, and then you can kind of keep hitting the target and proc vital strikes to get this vigor back all the time. And likewise with Soar, we can do that. So we have this here, where uh, you have the Soar, and then you get this cloud around you that applies vulnerable all the time. Same story. And we also have the Eagle Primary Hall here for the start. We don't really care about the centipede at the start because we don't really have a lot of points to put into these passives. And we don't care that much about the damage reduction while leveling up to 60, for example. So this is kind of the leveling setup here with the Eagle Hall. It allows you to pick up some of these uh, Eagle passives down here, which are kind of cool as well. And then you can also use your Evade to deal damage in the early game. So it's kind of nice. So especially if you get boots that have attacks, re reduce Evade cooldown, then you can like, Evade every few seconds, shoot out those feathers, they apply vulnerable and do some some damage and again you can trigger vital strikes and have good amount of resources but as you level up it's gonna become better and then you know here we still have for example rock splitter on the bar as like a generator we still have vital strikes for example for the t1 starter variant but the resource economy will get a lot better for example also when you have a cursed touch or maybe any other like resource power that actually helps you a little bit here there's a few options available that you know whatever you find you might just uh, throw it on your rings uh, just to like smooth out the gameplay a little bit early on and then eventually get the uniques and with Roderick Kepideki you will just be able to spam everything and you can do the Prodigy's Tempo combo here. There are also some endgame variants a little bit so we have Speed Palm for example where we can throw in a sword instead of counter attack if it's just like you know destroying everything anyway then you can at least also jump around with the sword a little bit and we can also go to Jackanth Shell because at this point you know if you're just like destroying like easy like health tides or whatever then you can get even more cooldown with this item you just have to remember this drains your life all the time so you kind of want to rely on the barriers that you got you get a lot of barriers from your crushing hand you also have auspicious for example that just accumulates the barrier when you're not fighting this is kind of nice to like not randomly get one tap when you don't press your buttons and you walk up to like the next target you know and one screen away or something like that because most barriers have very short duration here but not this one this one is actually permanent it just kind of keeps piling up as you go and especially out of combat it helps you to negate this effect and not manually get one shot with one hp from the jack of shell you can get even more barriers here for example from the um, runes that we have so you have the quare rune that gives us earthen bulwark we can also go even faster with uh, the jar rune so i actually uh, tried the jar rune on this build for the teleport and that actually felt really good on us so you kind of teleport around with your evade and uh, you go extremely fast <laughs> with this and then here's a pit push variant so there's also just like some slight tweaks from the original a mythic variant here just to go a little bit higher if you want to like you know push your glyphs and so on our paragons look like this so we have uh, those four balls here a viscous shield we have a lot of barriers so this gives us a huge damage buff from uh, just being barriered all the time there's also a bunch of really good notes here like the damage reduction from bristle for example then we have stepping we just kind of spam our skills all the time anyway so in this case you get this all the time you also get a vigor regeneration there in the early game at least this matters a little bit 
It's kind of nice. Then we have the revealing. So this is uh, knockdown synergies and crowd control synergies. We have a lot of crowd controls, as I mentioned. So you can have like stun, immobilize, freeze, fear, knockdown, slow. Uh, basically everything in the entire game. <laughs> the days even. So I think this actually has every single crowd control type, if I'm not mistaken. In this setup here, so you have incredible stagger. And this will all even be active on the bosses most of the time. And then we have a drive here. So this is not really that crazy, but uh, since it's mostly like a speed farming build, you go very fast, you will actually keep this up relatively well. It will not really be that great on boss fights, but I didn't really find like another really great option that I liked here. So I went with drive instead. Conversions would be nice, but it doesn't really help us. We don't really have a way to stack it. Uh, conversions, unfortunately, does not work with non-physical damage. It only works with physical or individual elemental rolls. And there's not really any glyph or any way to get physical damage bonus. You know, didn't we want to use like, let's say, a random glyph like wildfire that actually gives us fire damage that we don't do just to get conversions. So drive it is. And for our glyphs, we have a lot of crit glyphs here. There's fitness that gives us also resources early on. Uh, spirit, again, a crit glyph. We have outmatch, very nice glyph here, gives us the um, extra physical damage, especially against the bosses where it matters. And then we have the extra resources here, this buffs our Kavadeke synergy, for example. Then we have uh, Colossal here, so for the Gorilla stuff and the Resolve stacks. And finally, Turf, it's just like a bit more damage reduction and a bunch of damage here. And overall, the setup will turn out to be very tanky, with the, especially the Centipede primary hall here. We have like, you know, over 5.5k life, we have, you know, kept armor, kept resistances. We have lots of uptime on counter attack and armor tide. So you're going to be pretty well protected here. And then, of course, the barrier so that it keeps spamming all the time. So this is going to be really comfy. And that also concludes this guide here. So I hope you enjoyed this. I wish you good luck with the Spiritborn in Season 6. Personally, I'm very excited to play the Crushing Hand uh, Spiritborn as well. I'll probably be starting with Quivaldi, but I really want to do this one very soon after because <laughs> I'm very excited to do like this insane speed bombing and uh, teleport around, uh, jump from pack to pack. It's, it feels really good with this build with this incredible AoE. So especially in the late game when you're like in Torrent 4 and just destroying everything, it's really fun. So you can also read up more on the details here and in our Max War guides. As I mentioned, I have done the end game and leveling crushing hand guide here. And there's also a bunch more like background information, a bunch of stuff I explained and a bunch of stuff that I didn't now. So you can also find, you know, some more details about, for example, the Ring of the Midnight Sun here and any kind of extra information you may need. And with that, I'm going to leave you. Hope you enjoyed this video. Wish you good luck and see you guys next time.